So welcome back to this week's review of Shogun. And now we're on episode 8 titled Abyss of Life. And like always this will contain spoilers. So by now, whether or not you like this show, there's only two episodes left. So this is a point of no return. At this point, it's too late. Now you have to finish it. And that's because it's just natural. You want to see how the show is going to wrap up. And once it's done, I will have a full series review. So stay tuned for that. But just looking at the reviews for the show, it's getting insane praise. It's almost amazing. On IMDb, it's like over a 9, and it's got like over 50,000 reviews. And it just seems like everywhere, people are just loving this show. And you know what? If you like this show, then, you know, more power to you. I'm a little mixed about it, but I don't like to be a Debbie Downer because I don't really enjoy hearing people complain. But I'm also not going to falsely praise something that I don't like. I don't really believe in that. So I'm hoping to just give you a good balance of both. But definitely what you notice with this series is they definitely went for a darker setting. And they really want to just emphasize that there's danger everywhere. Everyone could just be an enemy. There's constant betrayals and death is normal. And I can't really say that this depiction of the story is either right or wrong. It's sort of their artistic choice. But what I will say is this episode finally gave us some sunlight and color. And I really enjoyed that, but then quickly it went back to misty weather. And after just 8 episodes of the same kind of weather, at least for me, I'm getting kind of tired of just seeing rain. It's sort of like when you get to the end of winter and it's spring. You just are fed up with being indoors and seeing gray. You want to be outside and have sunlight and color. And that's sort of how I'm feeling with this show. But now is the time when my choices are few. Anyway, I wasn't really a fan of episode 8. It was just very bleak and nothing too exciting really happened. Again, more setup. But I'm sure someone can create a review saying that this is the best episode of television ever. I'd almost like to see that, it might even change my mind. It's amazing how people could just do that. But again, let me know in the comments if you think this was a good episode. So this episode takes place right after the death of Nagakata, which is Toronaga's son. And at his funeral, you could tell that no one really liked him. Even at his funeral, no one is saying anything nice about him. Except Omi. He was his only friend, maybe. And Butaro also said something nice, too. Basically, Nagakado was reckless, and he died because of it. And everyone knows that. <laughs> and Turunaga seems almost sickened by his son's death. He's almost sick in his heart. And it's interesting because in this show, this is his only son. But in the novel, he actually has quite a few sons. So it is definitely more impactful for him in this version. Of course, Nagakalo didn't die in the novel either. But Turunaga in this episode definitely appears weak and just defeated. And I almost hate seeing him like this. <laughs> And in fact, he's even willing to admit defeat to Ishida. Or, of course, at least he appears to be defeated by Ishida. But us, the audience, and even Toranaga's men aren't on the inside of what the actual plan is. So for us, the viewer, it's a real downer just seeing Toranaga like this. And again, we're not really sure if this is all just an act. Is it just to appear defeated so that his plan could work? But he just looks terrible. And he's even coughing like he's sick. And it's definitely not how you want to remember just such a 
strong character. And so Toranaga gathers his vassals in Edo, and this is to certify his decision. He states that he will knock Odru with Crimson Sky. This was the plan to attack Osaka and overthrow Lord Ishido and the Council of Regents. Instead, he's going to march off to his execution. And also, not only that, but many of his men will have to join him. So it's not fun for everyone. And to top it off, he wants signatures from all of his vassals. And surprisingly, Yabushige and his nephew Omi are the only ones that sign, and this is before a protest breaks out. And this is because the vassals have a duty to give honest advice. They're not just yes-men. And their advice is basically that this course of action is stupid. And it's madness. Surely, it's better and more honorable just to stay in Edo and to defend their home territory. And they even have an advantage over Ishido's forces, though they still lack the numbers. But Toranaga says no to this. He states that it will destroy the city, and that an attack on Osaka would destroy the realm. And he states that the survival of the clan is secondary to the survival of Japan. And that's a statement you'd probably never hear a warlord stating. And by now, pretty much every episode has given us a big death, usually at the end of the episode. And this week, it's Hirumatsu. And this is Toranaga's oldest and closest friend. And it's sad because Hirumatsu is just begging Toranaga to stop. But Toranaga refuses. And Hirumatsu goes through with it, and he commits seppuku. But Turunaga actually allows him to go through with it. He doesn't stop him. And it was definitely one of the more graphic depictions of seppuku that I've ever seen in both movies and television and even anime. And even just the way the head hits the floor, it, yeah, it was disturbing. And I noticed that the show does like to do at least one over-the-top gore sequence per episode. We've seen cannonballs just demolish a guy, another guy split his head open on a rock. Now we got a graphic seppuku. But the scene also plays a second unexpected purpose. And this is because the regents grant Toranaga several weeks to grieve. And this is before he needs to report for his execution. And just looking at him, he looks physically sick. In every action, he just looks like he's given up. And earlier in the episode, he goes as far as to send Father Albedo back to Osaka. And that's to report that he's accepted his fate. But first, he actually grants him land for a new church. But it looks like it's going to be right where the red light district is going to be built. So basically, the church is going to be right next door to courtesans. So it's sort of a backhanded gift. And Father Avito does not look happy when he finds that out. But by deploying the priests, it gives the belief that Toranaga might actually be planning something after all. And Hiramatsu points this out to Mariko. Basically, why send a messenger to Osaka, and this is to report your willingness to die, if you're already on your way there? And in his challenge, Hiramatsu is really seeking to root out for the group that they've suspected. And that's that Turunaga has something else planned. But by forcing his closest friend to commit seppuku, He's convincing his enemies that the fight is truly lost for him. So this is all just one big deception. I, for one, would not allow my best friend to do that. <laughs> and meanwhile, John and Yabushige, they seem to be getting along pretty well. And it's about the only friend John has at this point, which is sad. May you, may you, may you, yeah, may you. And they both work together to steal John's ship back. 
And with the ship, they can now attack each of those Portuguese allies. But Hiromatsu's death is also what convinced Yabushige to fight by John's side. So all of it is sort of connected in a way. And in this episode, John finally gets to visit his men. And I don't think we've seen them since episode 1. But when John visits them, one of them just hates him. He blames John for everything. And they actually get into a fist fight. And this scene I thought was a big letdown from the novel. In the novel, it was revealed that his men were put in an Eda village. These were the lowest class of people. And when John visits them, they're actually really happy to see him. They thought he died. But he's changed so much that he's really unable to enjoy their company. And it was more like his love for Japan and his new life made it impossible for him to ever go back. He just sees how filthy they are, and also how unclean he used to be in that life. And the sad truth is, even if he brought Mariko back home, it still wouldn't be the same. But with this version of the story, this scene is more so used to just show that John, at this point, really has no friends or allies. And I definitely just prefer how the novel played the scene out. And there's also a kind of touching scene involving Buntaro and he's actually trying to be the best decent husband that he can. And he performs a tea ceremony for Mariko. And then he nicely asks for her to kill herself with him that night. Very romantic. But the way he sees it is that they're both facing a death sentence. So the best way is just to finally grant her her wish and to take her own life along with him. That way they'll die together as husband and wife. But Mariko rejects this offer. And by doing so, she's tearing down her own internal eightfold fence. But she reveals that she saw death as just an escape. Not as a way to be united with him forever. And even though Buntaro isn't the nicest guy, he kind of deserves it, it still was a pretty harsh rejection. But I'd expect nothing less from the cold-faced Lady Mariko. And the rejection is so bad that it reduces this strong samurai to tears. And I kind of felt bad for him. But in the tea ceremony scene, and a few others in the episode, I noticed there was a lot of poetry. And that's great if you're really into haikus and that kind of poetry stuff. But just for me personally, it really just goes over my head. It's just words. I was never really that into poetry. But if you are, you know, this is the episode for you. Matsubakari <laughs> But while watching this, I noticed that there's a certain poetry in just the narrative role that Mariko plays. And as a translator, it's been her job to just relay other characters' beliefs to one another. But at the end of this episode, and just a big twist, she helps Toronaga reveal his true intentions. But she relays that to us, the audience and I thought that was pretty clever. And she translates to us that Toranaga and Hiromatsu plans this entire thing. So yes, the gruesome seppuku scene that we got, it was the only way Toranaga tells us that they could convince Ishido and even Lady Ochiba back in Osaka that his surrender actually is legitimate. Which of course now we know it's not. So Toranaga does plan to fight, he's not just gonna give up. And it's not even just fighting, it's more like he wants to conquer. So it looks like Crimson Sky is back on the menu. But sad because Hiromatsu sacrificed his life for this plan. And also by accident, Nagakado did too. He slipped on that banana peel. And all this gave Toranaga more time, which is very valuable. And 
And just after getting this information from Toronaga, on his orders, Moriko then makes a surprise visit to Yabushige and John's getaway ship. And she's going to plan on continuing to serve as the translator. And this is to help Toronaga ultimately wage war for the future of Japan. And it's also worth noting that next week's episode is titled Crimson Sky, named after Toronaga's big battle plan. So overall, I found episode 8 to be a bit too slow, and it also had too much of a downer note. And I understand that it was used for Turanaga's deception plan, make your enemies think you're weak when you're actually strong, but we've already seen too many setup episodes like this. It's always setting up something to happen, but never really delivers on anything big. And also just the visuals being really dark, they're obviously an artistic choice and this is for mood. But not every episode needed to have rain and mists. You know, they could give us some sunlight every now and then. And I'm also not really a fan of just how isolated John is from everyone. There really is nothing for him to like in Japan. It must be horrible for him. And the novel was definitely more about just showing John how great Japan is and its culture. And just him falling in love with it. And obviously by now this adaptation is going for something much darker. Anyway, I am still curious and looking forward to the next episode just to see Toranaga's plan and how it plays out. And I could just tell that this show is definitely going to end on a bit of a downer. So don't expect a happy ending. And by now I'm just starting to form my opinion of the series as a whole. But the next two episodes could change that so we'll have to wait to see. And I did do a poll at the beginning of recording this video, and as of now, it's looking like you guys really like the show. So yeah, you guys are loving the show, and I'm glad to hear it. And that's unfortunate for people who aren't liking the show, the Nerdy Ronin. Unfortunately, you guys might be alone. Anyway, I'll be sure to put out more Shogun videos. I do want to do a novel review. And I'm also going to do some comparisons of just the different adaptations. Anyway, thanks for watching and thanks for voting. If you want to support me, I do have a Patreon. It's in the description. And if you want to join in on some discussions, I have a free Discord. Also in the description. And like always, thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.